Thank you Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Taylor and I make scrunchies and bows. I've been doing so for 10 years now. In today's video, I'm gonna be talking about how much money I made in July. And I'm also going to be throwing some other stats in there, like what I made last year, what I made the last few months as well, just to give you guys an idea of what it's like for me running a full-time business as a scrunchie maker. And I'm also a content creator too. So I have the YouTube channel, I post a lot of Instagram content, and I have sponsorship deals. So there's a few different things in this video that I'm going to be talking about. I'll also be giving a couple tips tricks and advice as well so stick around because you guys asked me a bunch of questions and I'm going to be answering them to the best of my ability and recommendations that I have from someone that's been running a business for 10 years and been doing the content creation for pretty much the same amount of time. I only probably started getting paid for that though a few years ago. It's also really funny to be filming this today because I actually went full-time with my business four years ago to the day. I had a memory come up today that was me logging out of my part-time job for the last time. It's been an amazing journey and definitely something that I was putting off for a long time, going full-time I guess. But let's just have a little brief intro of who I am just in case you've never watched this channel before and you're like, who are you? <laughs> I started a business when I was 15 years old, I'm now 25. I started making hair bows and selling them on Etsy. So Etsy was my first platform that I started selling on. I sold probably $4,000 the first year. So it wasn't a lot of money, uh, but it's for a 15 year old, that was a lot of money for me. <laughs> so I gradually got better and better and sold more as the years went on. And when I graduated from high school, I started doing markets and dabbling in other things like scrunchies. So I'm making scrunchies and other bits and pieces. I've made lots of things over my career as a small business owner. I've like gone into a lot of different fields, but it has usually been to do with hair accessories or beauty in relation to like handmade. That's pretty much where I've sort of stayed, even though I have dabbled in like tie-dye accessories and stuff. But yeah, that's sort of where I've stayed. I went full-time four years ago with the business. At the time I was studying in university and I just started my YouTube channel. And the year prior, I did quit one of my other part-time jobs. I got to a breaking point for me when I was working, you know, 12 to 15 hours per day, every day. And I was like, nope, one of these gotta go. I actually ended up cutting two loose and I'll explain more about that in the questions because I had a couple questions about that as well. Currently, I hand make scrunchies, bows, other hair accessories. I have a couple imported items like hair combs and hair claws. I started to make other items such as tote bags and makeup bags and I've got a few more coming in yeah the next few months as well especially for christmas time i do still have etsy but i've moved to my own website on shopify and i definitely don't look back from that it's been amazing on there really really great platform and i also do markets almost every weekend as well so i'll go to my local ones i don't particularly like to travel very far these days i like to just do the easy ones i know that i've got a lot of clients a lot of people that love my products so i usually just go to those i don't really adventure out further than that, <laughs> further than probably an hour radius. And I'll try and do one to two of those a week as well. Now, besides the business side of things where I'm making stuff and selling things, I am also an online content creator. So I'm a YouTuber, so I get paid from YouTube. I have an Instagram following of 112,000. I'm on TikTok, Facebook. I'm in a lot of different, yeah, the social world. It is tiring <laughs> to do both. Uh, when you are a small business owner, you're kind of juggling a lot of hats. In some aspects, you do really have to do social media to proceed further with your business. But I'm gonna talk about some other ways that you can, I guess, avoid or try and do it without doing too much social media. As I had a couple questions about that too. Well, uh, I'm gonna just go into why you guys clicked on this video. <laughs> and go straight into the nitty-gritty numbers. I know a lot of people feel weird about the money, uh, sharing money online and how much you make, but I feel like it's an important aspect, especially me being an online creator that makes videos for other small businesses or other people that are creative. And just to give some insight into what it's like for me personally, as a creative small business owner. Obviously these stats aren't gonna be the same for everyone, even if they do very similar stuff to me or even if they're a content creator or if they're a small business owner. It's also probably relevant to mention I am in Australia. So this is Australian, like the AUD currency, not USD or anything like that either. It is a very comfortable amount that I can live off. All right, so I'm going to be telling you what I've made in July. July, I would say probably isn't my slowest month of the year. I would save that for probably January, February, because I have most of January off and I don't really do markets. 
And yeah, February, March, it sort of slows right down, especially for online. I think this year in February, I made about $2,000 online. So it was very, very low compared to other years, especially previous. Uh, there's a lot of things going on in the economy right now as well. So yeah, there's a lot of different moving parts, but I have a lot of different revenue streams. So I would highly recommend this for anyone that is in the small business world or online creator world to have a lot of different revenue streams, especially ones that may be more passive than others. There's only so many scrunchies that you can make until you you just can't do it anymore. Like there's, you can't physically make more scrunchies than what you could earn. So that's why I have diversified and started making other products, but also started the content creation for YouTube as well. So my advice to you is to not have all your eggs in one basket. I got told that a very long time ago when I was researching online business stuff and that has stuck with me throughout the years. And also I'd like to clarify with these numbers that I have been doing this for 10 years. This, this isn't just, you know, I woke up one day and decided to start a business and now I'm like a multimillionaire. That is not what this is. <laughs> uh, it takes a lot of time. It takes so much effort to, I guess, get these numbers. Not everyone is an overnight success. It's actually very, 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 very small percentage of people that sort of become an overnight success from like a viral video. And even if you have a viral video, I have had viral videos. They do not mean really much. Uh, they might get you a bunch of followers, but it doesn't necessarily translate into sales. It really depends on who gets seen the product. Also, don't quit your day job until you find that you are earning a substantial amount, you have a business plan in place, you can see yourself growing in the future, you can sort of pivot your product or pivot what you're doing to continue on with the trends. I've done that throughout the years, I've introduced scrunchies, now I've got makeup bags, always on top of trends and trying to pivot towards those. Also the hair bows, they came back in and I started making different types of hair bows. So you always have to be on top of trends and everything as well. Now, July in particular, it was a big month for me uh, for many different reasons. I had a couple of really big brand deals. I don't normally have a lot of brand deals. It's more something I've been looking into this year just to bump up my, I guess, salary because online has been very slow this year for me. But in saying that, July, it's, it's still not as high as, say, September, October, November, December when the Christmas months start rolling in and I'm doing like eight markets a month and I've got all the online stuff of Christmas going up or like the advent calendars. That's where I make most of my money is those four last months of the year. But yeah, I'm very, very happy with how July went. But yeah, it does go up and down. The first half of the year is generally very slow for me. And also another disclaimer, this is just raw amounts. This is the revenue. It's not my profit. So it's, it's not including the taxes I pay, the GST I pay, all the supplies. It doesn't include anything like that. So so it's just my revenue. Yeah. <laughs> so I just like to point that out as well. But okay, let's get into it. Where I made my money for July 2024. So I've got a few different income streams. I do markets. I have my YouTube payments, which is YouTube AdSense, brand deals. I have my Etsy shop, Shopify, wholesale. I do have items in an actual shop. I also have affiliate links. So many different ways that I can generate revenue and make money. Half of them are probably, yeah, more to do with the business and the other half are just an extension of the business, me sharing ideas, sharing my everyday life as a small time business owner. All right, let's start off with markets. So I did four markets in July and brought in $2,197. I'd say that is a pretty average amount for, yeah, markets in July. My markets are usually around $500 in the first half of the year. And then during the second half of the year, they can be anywhere between $500 to $2,000 per market. My YouTube AdSense, that was $1,506. Now that is very low. <laughs> uh, last probably six months, YouTube for me has been super low on, I guess, my views that were down at the start of the year, which, yeah, made my hours down, which made it a bit hard. I'd say usually probably be more in the 2000s to 3000s for YouTube AdSense, but I mean, 1500 is still amazing considering I only really post one video a week. Next one is Shopify. So that is my online store where I sell my products. I made $3,350. Again, that includes shipping and everything in there too. But I did have a sales event. I had the Lucky Ducks launch, which is like a mystery box sort of thing uh, that I did on live. So I think a lot of that was from, yeah, doing that. <laughs> 
Then we've got brand deals. Now, brand deals, as I said earlier in the video, I don't generally get a lot of brand deals or, well, I didn't, but now I've started to diversify my income even more and trying to get more brand deals and work with people that I, yeah, like working with. You might see a couple more brand deals in the future from me, but I made $6,179 from brand deals which was amazing, but yeah, very out of the ordinary. It's not something that would happen every month. I don't have the time to be doing brand deals every single month. The amount that I did, because I did a couple brand deals that month. And then we've got affiliate links. So an affiliate link is pretty much when you have a link, someone clicks it and they buy something from that website. I get paid a commission from that for like sharing the link. I made $444 from affiliate links in July which is really amazing. I have some in the descriptions of my YouTube videos. I have an actual affiliate link page for people that if they want to support me, they can go on there. Uh, they might be able to find a discount code on there too from me uh, partnering with these different businesses. The biggest ones I get paid from are probably Shopify and Fun Day, which is actually like a confectionery one because they actually pay really well. I've been doing affiliate marketing for a long time. I started off a couple years ago with it but I didn't really realize the potential of it until this year and really looked into it. So I think I'll keep, yeah, trying to collect more affiliates or yeah, just get more involved with that. And then we've got Etsy. So Etsy brought in $186. Honestly, probably half of that was taken in fees, but we won't go too much into that. I also have wholesale. Now my wholesale, I did not have any this month. I would say the wholesales would probably start maybe September, October because people will be looking to get products in for Christmas. And then I have a couple products in like a shopping Glengarry and that made $20. So I used to do commission based things in local towns, I guess, close to me. But the one I did have my products at, they shut down and I just got them at the local cafe now and yeah, they're really easy to deal with, so I don't mind just having stuff there. I don't really do commission-based stuff anymore. It's just a bit too hard for me. And you really have to have a lot of trust in the business, I guess, that you're dealing with. And I'd rather be close by to be able to go in and restock when I can. But yeah, all right. So the total amount for July 2024 was $13,882. Really, really big month for me. I think combination of the Lucky Ducks for Shopify, but also having that massive, like those massive brand deals come through was really, really cool. In comparison, last year in 2023, I made $8,023. So it has jumped up quite a bit, which is really, really cool. I probably won't go into so much detail for these other two months, but I just wanted to like kind of show you a little bit more. For June, I didn't have any brand deals. I didn't make any money from the shop and I only made very small amounts from affiliates. I only had three markets and YouTube was probably the lowest I've ever been paid. So I actually only brought in $7,008. Still a good amount, but yeah, quite under. And in comparison, the year before in 2023, I brought in 12,678. So it was almost half of what I made last year. And then for May of this year, I brought in $11,117. Again, no brand deals, no wholesale, very little on the brick and mortar shop that I stock. I did sell a lot at markets and Shopify. I had eight markets and brought in like $3,832. So it was almost around that $500 mark. I'm sure that there was some that were way under like $300 and some that were like a thousand, but yeah, they sort of all average out. And then Shopify, I launched my bag collection. So that brought in $5,090 uh, for, for that month. Obviously not everyone was buying the bags, but yeah, that did contribute to such a good month on Shopify. And the year before I made 10, $1,121. So it was a very similar amount of money. All right, all together for like the last three months, it was $32,007. To give some more clarity, last year it was $30,822 for the same three months. On average, it's around $10,000 a month bringing in for my small business in the middle of the year. First part of the year is a, like quite a bit lower, but then the end of the year, it's quite a bit higher. 
and when you smash those together as well it just evens out across the board but obviously there are yeah a lot of things that go into a small business and yeah you got your like materials <laughs> other supplies tax and gst and yeah just a whole bunch of other things but i am going to go into questions so i have so many questions that were left by you guys and I've sort of like broken them up or at least tried to into different categories, see below what they are. So we're going to just talk about the money and money advice to start off with because I think that's good to like lead into what earns me the most money and what is most satisfying for me to do. What actually earns me the most money would probably, it's really hard to say because usually like if you round out everything for the whole year, it's about 30-30-30. 30% YouTube income, 30% Shopify, so like online sales, and then 30% at markets. I'll say those are my three big ones, and then whatever else is shoved in between like that 10% that's left. It probably will be a bit different this year because I've got a lot more brand deals, but I might even like combine that into the YouTube income because it's sort of like the same thing, but sort of not, but yeah. But what is the most satisfying for me? Honestly, I love making. I really, really love and enjoy just sewing and creating things. Making the makeup bags recently, I found so much joy in that, trying to design my own ones, trying to figure out how people did the patterns, working out those different sizes and doing heaps of trials. That is my element. I love doing that. Also love sharing advice with you guys and making videos like this. I don't particularly love the editing side of things and like I guess the more nitty gritty. I, I don't particularly like posting online and stuff, but I do love the outcome. I love that I'm able to help people with these videos and with this information. So that to me is a really satisfying part of the job I do and just makes it really worthwhile. What do I spend most of my time on? So let's just say for an average week, I'd say Monday and Tuesdays, I'm usually doing online orders. Wednesdays I usually leave free because I'm either doing online orders or I'm doing market stock or I'm doing editing or I'm doing a brand deal. Like I usually leave free because I'll need to do something there and I'll shove something else in that Wednesday. I mostly use Thursday, the full day, for editing stuff. Uh, it usually takes me a full day to edit a video. When, when I say full day it probably only takes me a few hours but by the time I like get over the pr procrastination of it. But then I also will try and do other things on that day to do with social media. But then I also sometimes do market prep on that day. So that happens too. Fridays I do generally leave for market prep. Saturdays and Sundays I usually have a market. So you'll notice that there's not really any days off in my work week. Most of the time that is true. I will usually work the full week. And I might only have a couple hours off here and there during the week. There won't really be a massive, you know, two days off like normal people have on a weekend or something. Some days I'll I'll just not feel like doing anything though and have the full day off and, you know, have it as a recovery day. But I'll go through that later when I talk about the burnout stuff. I do spend most of my time making, I would say. Most of the time is making. I'll, the content side of things, I'd probably say it's only one day worth of my work per week. Between editing and stuff, a video like this will maybe bump that up a bit because I actually had to do, you know, a little bit of research for that. <laughs> and I also like sit down and chat for probably four hours and then have to try and condense it down. So yeah, there is a lot like that, but usually the videos I usually post, they're more vlogging videos. So I'm usually making stuff and I've just got my camera just kind of filming what I'm doing. So it's not as a big chunk of my day. Do you have to be a creator online to make money? No, you do not have to be a creator online to make money like in your small business. I know it's very common these days to see like the person behind the small business and it does help. But if you are anxious or you don't want to have your face on camera, there's a lot of different ways that you can post content without having your face or if that's the reason why. But if you really just don't want to be online at all, I just really suggest going to markets. I do. I suggest getting out there and meeting people in person. I suggest going to different places that might be able to stock your product. For scrunchies, uh, I mean, they are oversaturated now, but if you have a product that isn't oversaturated or you wanted to try in your hometown, I'd go to places like hairdressers and stuff and ask for, if they're looking for wholesalers. Yeah, go from there. So you'll be able to make money through that. Sort of a loophole if it's still 
I don't know if it really is a content creator thing, but you can probably try Facebook groups as well. There's a lot of different ways that you can make money by posting on those. Obviously, you need to be careful of the rules on Facebook, like the specific groups that you're in. I got a lot of my big breaks from big girls groups that are in my area. Yeah, I just posted like what I was doing and people got interested and either followed me or bought stuff from me. So there's stuff like that too, without really being the content creator side of things. So there's definitely ways around it. It just might take a bit more time to get an established audience. I know a lady that's been in her business for 20 years and she has no social media whatsoever and she just goes to markets and she has so much clientele from just markets because people know her. She goes every week to uh, specific ones and yeah, she just has her email address. It's the only thing she gives out if people want to contact her. And I think that's really inspiring as well in a world that's so driven by social media that they are able to, I guess, succeed without being in social media. So it's definitely possible. Absolutely. Being a content creator or just being online in general is not your thing. You can definitely do a business without it. It's just a bit different to how a lot of the other people would run their business. You'd be more in person, I suppose rather than, yeah, being online. Now, I see this quite a lot, and I feel like I need to mention it because you don't know until you do it, <laughs> I guess, uh, and people wouldn't know to ask the question, uh, I, and I see it so much in the groups, I mean, but GST and taxes. Now, this is more relevant to Australia, but common misconception that GST is the tax that you pay when you're just starting out, and I feel like a lot of people think that it's like GST, oh, I don't have to pay that because I don't earn $75,000. But GST isn't what you're thinking it is in most cases. A lot of people think it is personal income tax. They're completely separate. So there's GST, which is goods and services tax, and then there's personal income tax. And they get, some people, uh, when they're first starting, they do get confused and think it's the same thing, but it's not. So GST, which is the goods and services tax, is for businesses that earn over $75,000 in revenue per calendar year. Doesn't matter when you start and stop. It's not like the uh, financial year or anything. It could be anywhere throughout that year. And you have to apply for it when you think you're going to earn over $75,000, if you estimate that. You can apply for it beforehand if you want to, up to you. I didn't until I was almost at the threshold back in 2020, I think, or 2019 actually. I don't know. It was it was a while ago. And it is 10% of your revenue. So 10% of my scrunchies, of my of my bows will go straight to the goods and services tax. There is like ways that you can bring it down by like, you know, buying other things. Yeah, it's confusing. I would recommend getting an accountant. But personal income tax, where I think a lot of people go wrong and confused, in Australia, when you earn over around $18,000, it's not exactly $18,000, but it's around there. When you earn over that amount, that's when you start paying tax on yeah, the money that you earn after that amount. And then it goes up in increments. I do have a video on that if you wanted to go watch it. And also another common misconception, it's not just for your business income that's around the $18,000. It's whatever income you earn as a per like your person. So if you work a part-time job and you have a small business and say you earned $25,000, you'll be paying tax on estimate like $6,000 of that. Could be way less, could be way more. Who knows? Get an accountant. I am not a financial person. I just have been doing this for a long time and sort of know little bits and pieces. That's just like a common misconception as well that yeah, the business income is completely separate. It's not like you combine both your personal income, unless you're not a sole trader, like your company or something. But if you're just starting out, let's be honest, you're not going to be over there just yet. So yeah, um, this will be more relevant information. Money advice tip, open multiple bank accounts and make sure there isn't a fee associated with those bank accounts because that will get you, <laughs> it might only be like a couple dollars but over years that will add up a lot of money. So I have a couple of different bank accounts. The current ones I use are a spendings account, an online transactions account which might sound silly but I only use one card to I guess place purchases on websites that you know have not the best reputation. I've never had an issue. I'm just going to point that out. I've never had an issue with like money being taken out of my account or my card being hacked or anything. I just like to be safe. I only put money uh, in that account when I'm going to spend money from it. 
So, I don't know, better be safe than sorry. So I just, I have one that is, yeah, just for online transactions. I have my business account, all my other transactions come from, and websites that I trust, like Spotlight and stuff. I also have a GST and taxes account. So I put in a percentage every single week for GST and then every single week for taxes. I have that automatically come out of my business account, go into a different account, and then my personal savings and then my bills and mortgage account. So there's a few different accounts there. When I first started my business, I made the mistake of having part-time job money going in and my small business money going in and then my personal spending's going out and my business expenses going out as well. So it was all like very confusing I guess during tax time because I had to really sift through things and you know if I didn't have the receipt I'd be like oh was that a purchase for myself or was that a purchase for my business it was so much easier once I started having an actual business account like just a separate account from my spendings and made a lot easier how much do you spend on your business I have a lot of deductions I am a fabric hoarder so I do love buying fabric, <laughs> so I do purchase a lot. So I have a lot of supplies, also like the electricity, a washing machine for when I like, I wash some of the fabrics, not all of them, but that sort of stuff all adds up. And I have a percentage from like my mortgage that I can use to, like as a deduction. Yeah, the amount that I make, so I don't have to pay as much tax. Yeah, there's like a whole bunch of things. I'll definitely recommend getting an accountant and having a chat with them about what you can claim back for deductions and stuff during tax time. I think the most in a financial year that I've ever spent was about $60,000. That specific year I did make quite a lot more than that though. Yeah, I think it was like 58000 So yeah, that, that was like all the deductions that I had. Pricing products. There are a lot of different ways that you can do this. My top two tips though are to remember to pay yourself and to remember hidden costs. But I've actually been on Skillshare recently and they have this amazing class which is all about pricing products, especially pricing your handmade products and also wholesale pricing as well. But instead of me telling you, I thought I'd let the sponsor of this video, which is Skillshare, share some insight. Skillshare is the largest online learning community for creatives with thousands of classes led by industry experts across film, illustration, design, freelance, productivity and more. Skillshare can help you take your career, skills, hobbies, passions, or side hustles to the next level. For me, I obviously am really into the business side of things, the handmade stuff. So I was able to select a bunch of different categories that were relevant to me and what I do, like entrepreneurship and textiles. There are so many different classes that you can take that will take I want to's into I made it happen. Here are some of the Skillshare classes. There's ones that are for YouTube, like this one, which is Grow Your First YouTube Channel, which talks about YouTube for beginners and how to start and grow your YouTube channel with 28 different lessons. So you could be well on your way to creating an online platform just like me. And the other amazing class is Social Media Content Creation in Canva, From Beginner to Advanced, which is by Maggie Stara. She has 53 lessons and so many different ways that you can learn more about social media and content creation. I can already see like a bunch of these would be amazing for me, like animating your email signature, captivating carousels, and even the philosophy of colors. I feel like that would be so interesting to learn more about. Heading back to the pricing question, how to price handmade items for profit. Daniel has some amazing information here in only seven lessons, 19 minutes long, super quick and efficient. You'll be able to learn two basic ways to price your products. If we go down to about this class section, it also has what you will learn, which is also how to price and sell wholesale which I feel like a lot of people ask about how not just to price their items, but to how to price their items in a way that they'll also be able to offer wholesale to other businesses. He also does true formulas that will cover most bases. So I feel like this one would be a great starter on how to price your products. But there are just so many different ways that you can learn and grow on Skillshare. And I just cannot wait. I'm so excited to jump right into learning more, developing my skills, and I want to share that with you guys too. So today, the first 500 people to use my link in description will receive a one month free trial for Skillshare so you guys can learn and develop your skills as well. Thank you so much, Skillshare, for sponsoring this video. Next, I'm going to do some 
social media advice some of the questions let's have a look how did you grow your business and gain social media followers as i said at the start of this video i've been in business for 10 years so naturally i have gained followers over time from just attending so many different events getting word of mouth from so many different people and yeah just being seen by that how i got the bulk of my followers especially on instagram for example was through reels I was posting a reel every single day and I had a couple go viral that had like 5 million views. So that is how I got a lot of my followers. I would have months where I would be growing like by the tens of thousands. Honestly, I think it's where it was like three years that it took me to go from 10k to 112k. It really isn't a very long time period to grow so much. I can thank reels really solely for that, just posting and being consistent. Uh, my biggest tip for social media is show up and be consistent, but it is really hard. And I'll go through that very soon with the burnout stuff. Scheduling posts, you do not want to show up every day. <laughs> and yeah, just having content there. I find behind the scenes works really well for me, especially I think because I have a lot of people following me that aren't just following me for my scrunchies. They're following me because they are small businesses themselves or they're interested in my story and in my progress, I guess. So they follow me to support me in that way. So I think, yeah, just making a lot of connections online helps as well. On YouTube, I've had, I've been lucky to have a couple, I wouldn't even say viral videos. They've only probably got 400,000 views, which is still a lot of views, but making trending videos and trying to, I guess, get more views and clicks helps and being relatable and posting advice. What to do when you're not growing. When I get a rush of energy and want to try and grow my stuff again, I usually try and do a few different things. I always change my strategy because the algorithms are always changing. People's interests are always changing. So you're going to kind of have to stay relevant and on topic and up to date. But at the moment, I'm finding lives to work really well for me and posting consistently. At the moment though, I'm not posting consistently and I'm not doing that many lives. So there's that. But if you're able to, definitely try and do it. And yeah, just try and show up for your business. How do you batch make reels? Okay, so with this question, it is a little bit harder if you don't have a YouTube channel, I guess. Because I actually batch make my reels from my YouTube content. So I will take videos that I've just filmed of me making stuff and like cut them down, flip them, and post them. You can still do a very similar thing. Just set up your phone or set up your like device and start filming whatever you're doing. Just do that a couple times a day while you're making things. And that way you'll have a whole bunch of different videos for that day already there. And you can just take snippets. You can speed it up, slow it down. You can put different music over the top. And then you can just schedule them. Make sure you have your phone out and just film everything, which is it's so annoying because it's like gets in the way, especially when like you're a creator and you just want to do the creative stuff. For me anyway, I feel like social media is such a big part of my business. It's something I kind of have to do. Otherwise, it's like kind of like a sink or swim moment. <laughs> All right, moving on to small business advice. On what platform do you get the most sales? My most sales online are from Shopify, Etsy. Uh, I don't really promote Etsy as much like it the links are everywhere for Etsy I just don't really promote it because like it's such a big fee for me Shopify just works out so much easier and better for me I do recommend it for anyone that is building a website so easy they have like everything already pre-built you just kind of have to add photos add your titles and everything already looks pretty I have a purchase theme now but you definitely don't have to start with a purchase theme you can start off with the free ones and yeah make a really nice looking website my current theme is Impulse. So that I think was oh, $300 USD maybe a couple years ago. It might be more, might be less now. I haven't been getting many orders. Usually what I do when I'm not getting a lot of orders, do a couple of different things. I look at the time of the year. So if it is earlier in the year, it is a lot harder to generate sales because it's just after the Christmas season, people's money is tight. Also look at the economy. So at the moment, the economy is a bit slower. Everything that happened in COVID. Yeah, it's good to pay attention to what's going on in the economy and the different exchange rates as well. If those two look all right, then maybe look at your website, have a look at maybe people can't check out properly, maybe get some friends to look at it, see what they say. Some common ones are, it's really hard to find products. So you don't have maybe a view all tab maybe you only can find 10 products on a page and you have like 100 products so people have to click next that's like a kind of annoying one maybe you don't have international shipping so maybe you get a lot of people on 
are internationally that look but can't check out might be worth looking into international shipping if that's something that you can or want to provide the listing photos maybe they're not adequate maybe they're not taken in natural light maybe they're very dull maybe they're blurry maybe people don't know what you're selling pages that you kind of look at and you're like i don't know what they sell i don't know what they do who is this person i feel like that helps as well having a very clear image of what you're doing who you are what you sell having where you are from on like very very plainly either either in like a faq page or maybe even in your bio on like your website in your instagram like if you're from australia <laughs> it would be helpful to have that somewhere then people know and then if it's like not the website if you're like maybe you're really not just not getting many traffic driven to your website have a look at on your socials so Posting more, posting consistently, posting snapshots of what you're doing, doing launches, and getting people excited for new products, getting excited for new colors of the product. If all else fails, you could try posting in like Facebook groups. Like recently I joined one that's like a wedding one and I'm bringing out bridesmaids gift boxes very soon. <laughs> When I say very soon, probably in a couple months, but I thought I'd have that in my back pocket. So when I do bring them out, I'll be able to message the admins, make sure it's okay. Um, I did read it was fine to, I think you might have to pay to post it, but that will be really good because I'll have my ideal clientele in that group. Like that's who's in that group, but stuff like that, searching for different Facebook groups that might allow posting in there because then you'll be targeting your actual audience rather than just randomly posting and hoping it gets reached to who you want it to be reached to. Also just doing markets as well. I would say if your first market doesn't do well, don't give up hope. Go to a couple, go to the same one a few times. I'd say go to it three times and make sure you're not going to it like in January, February, March because they are very low months just to begin with. Try them out in an October month, for example. Very good to generate sales in. People are starting to look for Christmas presents and stuff. Do I need a lot of money to start out? I love this question because I started out with I think 20 or $50, like it was tiny, like it was a, it was a note. It was a, it was a plain note and that was it. And it was from a birthday present uh, or Christmas present. It was just some money I had, you know, saved up and I went out and purchased one bottle of glue. I already had some sewing supplies, like a needle and a thread. And I just went and purchased some pieces of fabric, which were 20 centimeters long. That is how I started my $100,000 business from 20 bucks. <laughs> so you certainly do not need to have a massive outlay. You can just work your way up. Like obviously there are a few things that like if you're starting like a laser business, you'll need to purchase massive machines and like those machines like $20,000. Same with like a candy freeze dry business. The way they do those aren't cheap. But if you're just starting out small and then work your way up, I find like that's a really good way to do it because you get used to just growing more organically and at a, at a slower pace which I feel like helps a lot learning how to deal with things. And I feel like if you are pushed into the deep end too soon, it's not always a good thing. So you definitely don't need a lot of money to start out on. And what you do, you don't even really need a sewing machine to start out with. If you do, I purchased a $99 sewing machine once I sold like a couple bows. Yeah, and that was great. It lasted me like four years before it just broke. And that was fine because then I, then I purchased a $300 sewing machine. And then... Uh, that one was too slow, so I purchased another $400 sewing machine. And that one was still doing a good job, but then I was like, no, I'm going to get an industrial. And that was $2,800. But that was, you know, spread out between 10 years, and it was just reinvesting back into the business, but at a slower rate. Yeah, I didn't have to get out a massive loan or anything, or I didn't have to ask my family for money or anything. I did it myself and slowly sold stuff, and then was able to, yeah, reinvest it back into my business. I think that's a really good way to start out, if I'll be honest. Rather than spending a lot of money, you don't know if you'll make it back. It'd be better to start off small. How many years did it take before your business took off? Before it took off? Well, it just really depends on what you would consider taking off to be. Enough money to live comfortably on or enough money that I can finally like quit part-time jobs. I was in business for about six years. I'd say like when I went full-time, I was very comfortable with the amount of money I was making. Like I saw a future in it. I was like, yep, yeah, I'm just going to take the leap and just do it. And I'm really, really glad I did because I feel like I wouldn't have got as far 
with working part-time as well as doing this because I was already so burnt out even back then. And don't get me wrong, I loved my part-time job. I loved it, loved it, loved it. I love working in retail. I love talking to customers. I love talking to people. And I loved like putting stock away and doing like kind of mindless activities, I suppose. Like I, I was also like one of the click and collect girls. So I was able to like just go and grab products from the shelves and like package it up. And then I'd come home and grab products from my shelves and package it up. <laughs> so I was like, it was very like similar work to what I was already doing. Now I'm gonna do motivation and burnout because I had so many questions from you guys about this topic and I have previously posted a video on burnout talking about it a lot in current vlogs because I have experienced really bad burnout before where I couldn't do anything, I didn't want to do anything and I, I was almost ready to throw in the towel. I did not want to do the business anymore because of how badly I was burnt out from life in general <laughs> but also the business. So it did take a lot to, I guess, get back and get into my happy place again and be able to be able to do all this again. But now I feel like I can get burnt out more easily just by, by working too hard and working too long and yeah, not taking time out for myself. So with that being said, let's get into this. <laughs> How do you stay motivated when you don't get sales? So I'd like to start off by saying it is so hard, like don't get me wrong, it is so hard to stay motivated when you're not getting sales or you're not making money. Put so much effort into maybe like a new product or a new release and you've got like zero sales. It's only just recently, like at the start of this year, that I was doing launches and I was only getting one or two sales from the launch, whereas like year before or year before that, that, I was getting maybe 10 to 50 orders on the night. It can be really disheartening to see that and like feel like all that work that you've just put in was like for nothing. But I think you just got to remember that in a small business, uh, in a business, any business in general, you're going to have ups and downs and you're going to have slow points and high points and you just kind of have to roll with the waves. The way I stay motivated, really, I guess, simple and basic. I really just love what I do. I love making things. Like if I don't get sales from like a launch, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I'm just like, well, maybe I'm going to use this time rather than trying to scramble to make heaps of orders I'm gonna use this time to get in stock and like get ahead or like maybe have a break yes yeah, so I'm I'm not getting too disheartened during those times anymore um, but I can definitely sympathize with how that would make other people feel I think just remembering that you will have low points in your business and just trying to find ways that you can yet yeah, grow it more like do more research watch more videos take more classes even just to grow your resources and your mind I feel like I am a very motivated person to begin with though so I don't know if this will even help anyone <laughs> do you ever feel like you're not doing enough I feel that all the time I feel so guilty having like even an hour just to myself and do nothing. I feel guilty even like, you know, stop work at like 7 p.m., maybe cook dinner, 8.39, sitting down to watch a movie. I'll feel like I have to be doing something, like I'll have to be making bows or I'll have to be threading scrunchies. I can't just sit down and relax and enjoy the moment because like I'll feel guilty. But I have tried really hard this year to try and take a step back from that and kind of put a line, draw a line between the two because it does get really blurred. But yeah, I definitely feel like that a lot. Um, and I'm working on it. I make items, but I don't sell. I don't think they are good enough. How did you get past this? I would call that imposter syndrome. Like, you feel like your products aren't good enough. I feel like a lot of people think that. I think that, um, personally, like, I feel like my products sometimes, like, oh, like, who's going to buy this? Who's going to like this? But it's just like, yeah, it is imposter syndrome. And it is hard to get past that. But you just got to take that leap and you just... You just got to start selling. You just, you never know. You never know. People might love them. Like when I first started selling scrunchies and especially the white elastic scrunchies, I'd never seen them before. I didn't even realize that white elastic wasn't the normal thing because <laughs> I had never really used a scrunchie before when I first started making them. That would be on me for not doing any research. <laughs> That's okay. I just used whatever elastic that I had laying around and I just happened to have white elastic. But yeah, and then I started getting comments about it and like how well they worked in the hair and uh, I think that gave motivation to me like to keep going and really helped a lot. And I feel like when you're starting out like that, that is such like a big thing to get reviews like that. Break through that first barrier and start selling even if you don't think they're perfect because other people might think they're perfect. If I started selling bows when I thought they were like perfect and not, no more improvements could be made, I probably would never have started selling them. When you start selling something and you make it continuously and 
um, you get feedback and you get reviews, then you start to develop and you start to develop your product and you can learn and grow from that. I feel like that first step to put your products out there, even though it is very vulnerable and it might make you feel uneasy, is so important and crucial because that way you can get feedback, you can get people saying good or bad, you can, I don't know, I feel like that helps. Like you look at my first scrunchie or bow and then you look at them what they are now, like they are so vastly different and they are leaps and bounds ahead of what they used to be. Making it so many times, you get better at it over time. Like my bows are no longer lopsided. They have a very specific weave that I do. They don't have glue marks everywhere. Like I remember one time I got a lady message me, this was probably six, seven years ago, and she said that there was a little bit of glue that was visible on the front of the bow. I tell you now, I've never made that mistake again of having glue on the front of the bow because now I put the glue on sort of more to the back and make sure like to inspect the product properly. But yeah, it's just important to like get out there and start getting those reviews and feedback in. I actually personally have a folder on my phone and it's called nice things people say. If I'm ever feeling that I'm yeah, feeling sorry for myself, I guess, or feeling bad or like feeling that I'm not good enough, I go look at that because that has like a bunch of reviews, a bunch of feedback, a bunch of beautiful comments from people, messages, and things that will make, yeah, make it, makes it so worthwhile doing all this stuff. I highly recommend any feedback that you get, anything nice that people say, put it in a folder just for a day that you feel like, you know, the world might be a bit too big for you and that everything feels like it's crushing. <laughs> Go have a look at that and it might make you feel a lot better because I know it makes me feel better when I'm feeling a bit down. Work-life balance. Ah, what a perfect question for me because I have none of it. <laughs> I, I'm i trying. This year, yeah, this year I'm trying to do the work-life balance thing and I mean I'm so much better than last year I, get, I think because like I'm, I'm only working a small, a smaller amount of time. Like I'm not working like, you know, the 15 hour days. Normally, like I might have one or two in a week, which is still pretty bad, but <laughs> I'll have days during the month. Like I'll have like a day or two off consecutively, like when I had a low week, maybe I've got no markets, maybe I haven't got a launch coming up. Although we are coming into the busy season, so maybe the slow down part won't happen until January again, but that's okay. <laughs> it's so hard with the work-life balance. I get like questions about like being better to, you know, maybe buy... A commercial building and then like go to work and then when you come home you'll be away from work I really hate that idea if I'll be honest I just don't think that would have worked for me at all for a start like I would have had to leave my house which I don't particularly like doing I feel like it would have made it a dreaded task I love being able to just come down here in my like get changed into a tracksuit come down from my bedroom into the craft room and work all day there's like never a point where i kind of switch off anyway because you know your phone's like right there and you get messages pinging all the time another way that i sort of i guess balance that a bit more is i have my phone on do not disturb a lot of the time now it does really help working on it so maybe check back in six months and see if i figured it out yet <laughs> how many hours a day do you work Let's just take today, for example, 7 a.m. until probably 9 p.m. It's going to be a long day for me. I've got a lot of things to do. But usually what I'm, what I'm trying to do is probably maybe starting work at 10 o'clock and finishing around the 6, 7 p.m. mark. So what's that, like 7, 8, 9 hours? So I'm probably, yeah, I'm trying to do like the 8 to 9 hour days. Honestly, probably not having any breaks though. I don't... Maybe like lunch here and there, but I don't usually eat a lot during the day anyway. Which I still work a lot. <laughs> My bad. Yeah, I just, I really like doing it. It's like, I love working. It doesn't feel like work unless it's, I guess, the content creation side of things. It feels a bit more worky when I have to like edit stuff. Sewing burnout. Do you get tired of the same thing? I really liked this question because it's not something I would have thought about unless someone like asked it. But... I don't get sewing burnout. I love making scrunchies. Like, I give me a tub and I'll just sew the whole thing. Like, I'll just sit there for hours and just sew, sew, sew. Don't, I don't experience that. I really love making the same thing. Something that I know exactly how to make. Really therapeutic for me. How do you deal with burnout? Great question. Also, again, still trying to work that one out for myself. But at the moment, when I'm feeling like really burnt out and like I know that I'm burnt out, it's, it's when I'm like, 
really trying to push stuff. I'm like really trying to get something done and it's feeling so, so heavy to do it. Like it's, it's like pushing a rock uphill. <laughs> When I'm feeling like that, I'm like, all right, we need a break. Some of the things I've been doing are going like for a walk. Uh, it is getting sunny again. Thank, oh, thank goodness, because I love the sun. So going to the park and like maybe getting some lunch and sitting out in the sun, just having the day off, being like, nope, <laughs> today is not my day. Maybe I've only had like five hours sleep, and I'm like, mm -mm, not doing it. So yeah, I'll like have the rest of the day off, and then I'll get up and feel really refreshed the next day. So I just feel like taking time out for yourself, it helps me, might help you. Yeah, I just feel like getting outside, getting some fresh air has really helped a lot, which I know it sounds like so silly, but it has really helped. Like maybe getting some physical activity, especially if you're someone like me that only really walks to and from the sewing machine. So I only probably get a hundred steps in a day. But yeah, I just feel like switching off and taking the rest that you need really is probably vital to that question. All right, and now I've got another section. I've called it other <laughs> because I didn't really know where to put these questions. Like they probably would have maybe fitted into some of the other sections, but here are these ones. Were you scared to buy a house by yourself and how did you manage? Yeah, I was petrified. I, I was really worried that you know, if the business went under, like, what would I do? How would I pay my mortgage repayments? Um, I knew that we were coming into a very slow time with sales across the world sort of thing. And, like, I saw a lot of businesses closing down. And I was like, is this really the right time to buy? And I'm so glad I did because I don't think I would have been able to get a loan if I had waited. I might have been able to get the house a little bit cheaper, maybe 20k cheaper, but I definitely wouldn't have been able to afford a loan because the interest rates went up even more. I know, I just had, I guess, faith. <laughs> I just knew that it was going to be okay. I just felt like it's going to be fine. I'm going to be okay. I've been doing this for so long. I have a steady income. It's not like one year I'll make 100k and the next I'll make 30k. It won't drop off drast so drastically that I'm going to be in trouble. And then I also had the YouTube payments behind me. My YouTube payments last year were actually more than what my mortgage repayments were. They were like, so yes, yes, I was scared. And how did you manage? Most of the money that I make, if it doesn't go straight back into the business or into like taxes and whatever else, like into those, pretty much goes straight into my savings. There's only a very small amount of money that I would have left for myself usually every month in between paying like the rent and bills and stuff before I purchase the house save up and I've always been a really good saver and that I think again comes into play with the different bank accounts I have different banks that I bank with because then that way I don't see it it's like it's not there if I don't see it <laughs> so I'll just throw it in there and then I don't check it like I don't have a card for that I don't I don't spend any money out of it used to get penalized if I spent money out of my savings account like you lose the extra interest and you know, when the interest is like 6% or 7% and you've got quite a bit of money in there, it adds up. Why did you want to start a business at such a young age and what got you started into making a business? Why I wanted to start at such a young age is because I was looking for a job. I was 15 and like I just turned 15 and I really wanted a part-time job. I wanted to make my own money, be able to, you know, start supporting myself you know, pay for my phone bill or whatever, like start saving up for a car and whatnot. I was applying to all these places. I actually had a friend at the time, they had like their niece's birthday party or something and I was invited uh, and I didn't have any money. <laughs> so I didn't really have any money to spend on like a birthday gift or something. So I was like, oh, let's make something for her. And I Googled things to make for little girls, come up with a bow tutorial. I had some fabric laying around and yeah, I went and purchased some fabric glue and whatnot. And yeah, I just made some bows. And that's how it started. That's like the idea and inspiration. And then I started getting ads. I got ads from, you know, online, other other small businesses online from America. It was like an Etsy ad, I think. And it, they were selling bows. And I was like, well, if they're selling bows that are handmade, I can sell bows that are handmade. And I just put two and two together. Will you hire someone? I get told this all the time that I should hire someone and I really need to hire someone, but I just don't want to hire anyone. I think I find it really hard to let go and I wouldn't want anyone sort of making the products. I guess they could help, but it'd be really hard anyway because I'd have to, I would have to be on top of things to be even able to give someone stuff to make. 
The only way I would probably hire someone would be more for the social media sort of things, um, like editing videos. But I don't think I'm at that stage yet that I can't handle everything. Like, I know I say, like, I'm really busy and, like, I'm burned out or whatever. I just, yeah, I just don't think I would do that right now. There's a lot more steps that I would take first before doing that. There's a lot more steps I'd take first, um, a lot more things I'd try out first before I would, like, reach the breaking point. I don't think so. I... Mm. No, not right now. <laughs> defective products, what do you do with them? Um, I don't get a lot of defective products these days. Like, I might have a broken hair claw here and there, broken from transit, or I might um, twist the elastic. Like, I don't twist the elastic and scrunchie, but sometimes I've had people that helped um, previously, like a couple years ago, helped here and there, but they've like twisted elastic or whatnot. I usually just keep them for myself or just give, them, give it to them because uh, I can't really do much with that. Like, I don't sell them or anything. How much longer do you think scrunchies will be fashionable enough to make a full-time income? Honestly, I thought scrunchies would be out by now. I anticipated two years, four years ago. So, considering that they're still being sold, and I'm... I have slowed down, but I feel like everyone's slowed down from the economy, so I don't specifically think it's just scrunchies. They're probably not as popular, don't get me wrong, but I feel like there's still definitely a market for them. But yeah, so I'm just going to keep selling them until you know, they really aren't selling. Uh, until that point, I'll just keep pottering along and, you know, interested in new product lines, seeing what I like making. You know, I still got the bows and everything. I feel like bows will never go out of fashion. I don't know if scrunchies... I know scrunchies are really popular in the 90s and they've come back, so, you know, I'll just keep looking at things that are bound to come around again or new products just to release. But yeah, always going to stay on top of it. Or, like, just getting more into the content side of things and just doing... Me, me made items. There's a lot of different ways I can pivot if scrunchies aren't what everyone wants anymore. And I think the main pivot would be more to the online stuff. And I think I've already started doing that by doing a lot more brand deals, trying to bump up the income that way. Do you feel you're managing things better now with your ADHD diagnosis? So I was diagnosed with ADHD in November of last year. Never had really thought about, you know, being... ADHD or autistic or anything like that uh, until someone commented on my channel asking if I was and like I haven't been officially diagnosed for autism. I don't know if I have autism. I never, yeah, I didn't want to really look into that side of the stuff because I, there wasn't really much I could do about it if I am and like who really cares if I am. It was more the ADHD side because I know there is medications that can help with that. So I wanted to go down that route I guess and see if what these comments were saying was true and yeah like I did have quite a few comments suggesting it I had people in real life suggest it to me especially when I brought it up the first time finding that out at such a late diagnosis uh, at 25 years old going through school uh, undiagnosed and all that as well it was it was really different I think um it helped me it, it really did help me it really I feel like something clicked into place when I found out and I was able to sort of realize what was not wrong with me, but what why I was different to the neurotypical of the world. So that really, I feel like that really helped a lot in finding who I am as a person and being able to deal with things a lot better now that I know. Now I'm able to like learn more about ADHD learn more about like the emotional dysregulation of things, like the how it's linked to burnout and how it's linked to so many other, like a plethora of other things. Been really interesting learning about all that over the last six or so months. I am managing things better now that I know, I guess, why I am the way I am. <laughs> like it has helped a lot. And I have like tried the medication as well. And I'm still, I'm still working that side of things out, I think. What is your degree? So, I actually don't have a degree. I ended up dropping out of university. I think I mentioned that right at the start of the video, that I had a couple things I dropped. And it was, yeah, the job, um, my part-time job, and also I dropped out of university studying a business degree. Probably would have helped in certain aspects of my life, like my English, like being able to speak maybe more clearly or more fluently. Like, I'm an English speaker, but I do stumble on words a lot and I'm not the best writer, I guess. Like, I, the way I say things or the way that I write things is kind of jumbled. Like, it's not proper, it's not the proper way to write things or do things. Probably would have helped in that way. In terms of, like, 
smartness and like knowing things about a business. I had already learned pretty much everything I'd learned, everything I was taught in that first seven months of doing the degree, I found sort of useless, if I'll be honest. It was stuff that was I already knew from studying business management in high school or stuff that I knew from having a business for six years or things that were just completely irrelevant to me. Yeah, I ended up just dropping out and that was probably the best thing I did. It was a massive waste of money for me personally. I only had like, it was like a $7,000 debt. I had to pay that off before I bought the house. So that, yeah, was massive money fail for me. How did you know you were able to go full-time? Um, I was able to go full-time when I pretty much just made a full-time income. Can't see it really going that badly. And if it does, I've got so many contingency plans. I think it's really important to be a lot of steps ahead in all different directions, just in case. I've always been like that. I've always had different pivots to pivot into to try out different roads to go down if yeah all else fails i'm really really loving everything i'm doing and i'm really happy with the amount of money i'm making i'm living very comfortably that is how much money i made in july <laughs> and um gave you a little bit more insight in how i make the ten thousand dollars a month I feel like I've been talking for so long. Oh, I hope this video was beneficial in some way. I hope it's given you maybe some inspiration, some advice, some tips, some tricks. I hope it made sense. If you have any questions, please let me know. I do try and read them. Might not respond to them all, but if it is a specific question that is easy enough for me to answer, I'll try and get back to it. And yeah, thank you so much Skillshare for sponsoring this video as well. I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a lovely day. Bye!